Tonight, in the Alfred Hospital's intensive care unit. She was getting really bad, bad headaches. She's all pulse along here. If we don't drain it, it's a threat to her life. Get well. Please, open your eyes. He collided with another boy on his bike midair. You can see that bit there should be stuck to that bit there. He's behaving as if he has what we call septic shock. Body's organs shut down because of infection. If we didn't do anything about it at the moment, I'm sure those would die. The sickest patients, the most advanced technology, medical care second to none. It's always a matter of life or death. Clint's been brought to the trauma part of the Alfred Hospital's ICU after crashing his bike in a motocross competition. From what we've been told, um, he collided with another boy on his bike mid-air. Um, the other boy rode his bike to the ground. Clint wasn't quite that clever and he parted company mid-air and crashed down to the ground. Clint's mum and dad never expected to see their son hooked up to a life support machine. Mike and men worked on him for an hour and a half at the track and then transported him by helicopter up here to the Alfred. Steve, his mate, said to me that, uh, oh, doesn't look good. <clears throat> then he said he was being airlifted. I thought <clears throat> that sort of freaked me a little bit. <clears throat> if you can hear me, can you squeeze my hand? Clint? Clint, open your eyes. Okay. Clint landed on his shoulder and head and knocked himself out. He has a small bleed on the brain, damaged nerves in the neck, a pinched artery, a bruised lung and a fractured rib, and his right shoulder is in a very bad way. That bit there should be stuck to that bit there. This round bit here, the head of the humerus, should be fitting in that little circle there. It should be about two more centimetres further up. Because it's quite a precarious fracture of his shoulder, um, it can impair the nerve impulses and the blood supply to the rest of his arm. So we're going to keep him sedated for now until the shoulder is fixed. Clint's in a drug-induced coma to keep him stable. He's moving his left arm only. It could be days before doctors know if his brain was damaged in the fall. Each time we've woken him up before, he's been agitated, confused and a bit combative. Combat's better than coma. We uh, are reassured that somebody is more likely to make a good recovery when they're combative than when they're just uh, comatose. He is in the best place, um, and we know that. And when we know we leave him here, we know he'll be looked after really well. Casey's been brought to a nearby cubicle after five and a half hours of emergency surgery on her brain. Casey's ended up a couple of weeks ago having a very bad headache and she presented to the hospital. They did a CT scan and found that she actually had very bad sinusitis leading up into her brain and she's had an abscess in her brain which they've actually removed in theatre yesterday. So she's now in intensive care. Casey's husband Dylan realised she was very ill when her severe headaches wouldn't go away. She was getting really bad, bad headache and uh, then I was a bit more worried and more concerned and then that morning she get up but she couldn't walk. She couldn't lift her foot up and uh, keep a proper step. Casey's problem started with a bad sinus infection that tracked backwards, spreading through the skull into the front part of her brain. Pus collected there and formed an abscess that needed to be surgically removed. Yesterday they took her into the theatre I was waiting outside with the little one. I was keep crying and they come and hold my hand. The worst thing was like, I was so worried when they said, cut their head from this side to the other end. And open, open the skull and I washed her brain. It's like freaked me out big times. This kind of infection is so rare and unexpected. The case is lucky they found it in time. That was pretty major neurosurgery that she required. Although it's a known complication of a sinus infection, it's a very severe complication and very uncommon one. Casey is really sick. 
Come on, love. Hold my hand. Her doctors need to wipe out all the deadly bugs in her brain before they can cause permanent damage. Give her a flying kiss. Get well. Get well. We miss you. <laughs> no, don't cry. Les Twentyman, popular Melbourne youth worker, is fighting for his life. Les suffered complications during lap band surgery and remains in intensive care. Over in the general pod, Melbourne youth worker Les Twentyman is desperately ill. Les is famous for his work with Melbourne street kids. He'd wanted to lose weight for a better quality of life, but he's ended up fighting for his life. Les has had a range of health issues for quite some time. We have a four-year-old granddaughter that um, Les adores and he's found it extremely difficult to keep up with her. He had no quality of life and he had diabetes and we were hopeful that the lap band would give him a good quality of life. You know, I said to me, this is going to be the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm now starting my life at the age of 60. I squeeze his fingers, waking up. Well, Les came to us following complications of laparoscopic gastric banding, which is essentially placing a little ring around the stomach to reduce its volume. And unfortunately, Les had a perforation of his stomach with leakage of stomach contents into where it shouldn't go, and soon after acquired infection related to the perforation and leakage of the gastric contents. Les is really sick, actually, at the moment. He's behaving as if he has what we call septic shock, which means the body's organs shut down because of infection spreading throughout the body. If we didn't do anything about it at the moment, I'm sure Les would die. The first stage now is to see how he gets on over the next few hours, see if he stabilises, see if he starts responding to the antibiotics and the other things that we're doing. David and his team are desperately worried. They need the antibiotics to kick in fast before Les's whole body shuts down. Back in the Alfred's intensive care unit, surgeons have managed to put all the pieces back together in Clint's shattered shoulder. You can see that the shaft now lines up with the head. Um, it's such a rocky, unstable fracture, it's taken a lot of screws and a plate to fix it. Eleven screws in there. Doctors have done what they can for his shoulder, but Clint's head injury has them worried. Every time they try to wind back his sedation, he grabs at his tubes and his left hands had to be strapped down. Each time he wakes up, he's combative, restless, agitated, not really cooperative. And now David's noticing another serious problem. Clint's not getting as much oxygen as he needs. Just out of the blue, no change of ventilation, no suction, no turns. His saturation went down to the low 80s. He's up to 100%. Uh, there's nothing to hear listening to his chest. You can see his waveforms are showing airflow obstruction there. He looks like he's ventilating both sides equally. Yeah, he looks good, sounds good, but yeah. just not gas exchange not happening. Let's have a look. David has to quickly find out what's going on before the problem gets any worse. Look, his expiratory airflow is delayed, so I, th I think we should put a, just put the bronc down and make sure his airways are clear. David's using a bronchoscope, yes. a fibre optic instrument, to look down inside Clint's lungs. Well, he's become suddenly hypoxic. He's still needing high levels of oxygen. So before we do any more difficult investigations, we want to make sure that he hasn't just got a whole lot of phlegm blocking off one of his lungs. And so the best way to do that is to uh, have a quick look down with the bronchoscope, which is what I'm doing now. OK, here we go. We're going down the endotracheal tube there. And there's the problem. That's exactly the problem. You can see there, instead of looking like that, wide open, pink all the way down, we look down there and we can see this side's almost completely occluded with mucus. You see those indentations on the wall there? He's got lots of little what we call mucus pits. That's where the mucus glands have become swollen from smoking. And that's part of the, this this man's problem is his phlegm, his chest is producing a lot more phlegm than uh, somebody who doesn't smoke. And so that phlegm is then building up in the chest and blocking off part of his lungs. Clint's recently given up smoking, but his lungs are still paying the price. So we're now going to go into this, put some local anaesthetic in there, and we're going to 
second lot of this mucus out. Lower load there, full of lots of secretions, which we're sucking out, clearing up. That's now clear. That's now clear. That's now clear. OK, we're done. His expiratory airflow's got a lot better. Look at that. David's pulled him through this time, but in the ICU, patients can go downhill in seconds. They'll need to watch Clint every minute of the day. In the general pod, Melbourne youth worker Les Twentyman is getting worse, and more surgery is the team's only option. He's behaving like there's infection yeah. in there that hasn't been dealt with. The plan is to take him back to theatre this morning. If there's any collection of pus or infected Which, fluid anywhere, they can take it out. Yeah. If that's left there, it's just going to get worse. I think our backs are up against the wall with him at the moment. I think we should do it. OK, that's fine. I think what comforts me is that I have the utmost confidence in, in what's happening, and I know that everything that can be done is being done as and is being done, you know, to the utmost level there is. So, I mean, Les, Les needs to do a little bit, so I'm fine. I'm, I'm really fine. If he thought that all this attention was here, he would be awake, enjoying every minute of it. Unfortunately, it's not so. We've kept a diary, so when he comes round, he can, um, he can read all about it. The difficulty is working out what the source of the infection is with Les potentially coming from the fluid around his chest. It's also potentially coming from the site of the surgery. And the surgeons have taken him back to theatre this morning to have a look inside and see what's going on. Right at the moment, I don't know how things are going to go with Les. I'm very concerned about the situation indeed. Are you able to squeeze my hands for me? And with this one? In a nearby cubicle, 25-year-old mother of one, Casey, is recovering after a sinus infection almost killed her. We just came around and had a look at Casey on the ward round. She's been back from her CT scan. She seems to be doing pretty well. She's waking up, she's breathing for herself, so we've just decided to take the breathing tube out. That's great news for Casey. She's one step closer to getting out of the ICU and home to her son, Ethan. <laughs> so the wound across the top of your head's looking really good. Everything's moving in the right direction. <laughs> yeah. So Casey's had a portion of bone removed out of her skull, and because of that, all the trauma of that process can lead to a lot of facial swelling. It will definitely go down over time. It just, it just makes it a little bit difficult for Casey at the moment to open her eyes. Casey's skull won't be closed over again until doctors are confident they've gotten all the bugs out. But she's doing really well, interacting with us brilliantly. Almost ready for the ward. Just wonderful news. <laughs> it's amazing to think that only two days ago, Casey had life-saving brain surgery. It all started with a migraine, like a bad, really bad headache. I had to go to doctors and explain my, the pain. It was like a tight band around my head. And they were very concerned, because they knew I didn't have this done, then it would just get worse and worse. Just, I think, and I wouldn't be able to function at all, I don't think. OK. I'll make sure that that's ordered for you by the time it gets up there. A few hours later, Casey's transferred to 4D, the neurosurgical ward. How's the head? Still feels really a bit heavy. When she was yesterday smiling and uh, just give a little tiny wave, it made me just so happy. I didn't expect something so suddenly. I mean, like... Made your day. Yeah, make my day big time. <laughs> There's no words to explain that. Very quick. So quick, yeah, <laughs> isn't it? I'm fine now. <laughs> You're not. Casey says she's feeling fine. But she can't possibly know her biggest fight is yet to come. Uh, I love it. <laughs> In 
the Alfred Hospital's ICU, Les has just had a second round of surgery to clean out the infection in his tummy. Les, it's David Pilcher here. I'm one of the doctors. I'm having a quick look over you. You're in the ICU. You've had a big operation. Les, who works with Melbourne Street Kids, was trying to lose weight so he could keep up with his four-year-old granddaughter. He ended up close to death. One drain in there that's still got a bit of drainage coming out of it. He's still very sick indeed, but um, we're watching how things are going to develop and waiting to see how he responds to the surgery, really. Les has now been in the ICU for five days. His wife and close friends are well aware he still has a fight on his hands. Uh, we're hopeful that he'll pull through. We want him back uh, out on the streets fighting the good fight and uh, working hard like he knows how to do best. If that fighting spirit that he's shown in his work uh, can shine through it, he'll be fine. Just days ago, Casey was talking and well enough to go to the ward. Today, she's been rushed back into surgery. Casey's first operation was to remove an abscess at the front of her brain. Now the infection has spread to the top of her brain. This is the current scan. She's got this pus collection now between the two halves of the brain, up here, along here. This is all pus along here. There's no way we could get all that out through the front, so we've got to do a new opening right on the top of the head up here, a little opening through the bone, and we'll, we'll drain all of that pus out. If we don't drain it, um, it's a threat to her life. Casey's life is in great hands. Professor Rosenfeld is one of Australia's leading neurosurgeons. The brain is very soft. And if we damage that part of her brain, she would get weakness and numbness on the left side of her body, particularly the left foot and left leg. You don't want to do that to her. Wait, where is she? Trying to collect some of the pus in the syringe. See it there? It's all coming out, see it? This would be the one of the biggest I've seen, actually. Quite a sick-looking brain. Despite her alertness, she's a very sick lady. Professor Rosenfeld has done all he can, but the bacteria in Casey's brain will keep trying to get the upper hand. Alfred Hospital's ICU, Les Twentyman is finally awake. Three weeks ago, Les was at death's door after weight loss surgery left him with severe infection. As you can see, Les has come round. He's, he's awake with us. He's got his uh, sarcasm and wick back, so he's quite well. He obviously gets very tired um, during the day, but he's doing really well and we're very pleased. In the trauma pod, it's almost two weeks since Clint crashed mid-air into another motocross rider. He's had a nasty bout of pneumonia, but now his lungs are on the mend. His chest is improving all the time, and um, such that today now he's been doing quite a lot of breathing on his own without the ventilator. We will need to do a MRI scan of his shoulder and arm, really in order to look at the nerve supply to his arm and see if that's been affected. So there's a few things that we're still concerned about. The brain injury, even though we have been told that it probably will repair itself, um, it's going to be a long time for him and, and the arm. To be honest, we were quite worried about the arm, whether we'll regain full use of that. Clint is starting to respond, but whether or not he has brain damage, is the big scary question. It's one day at a time and he's taking little steps. Mm. It's been five months since Les's lap band surgery went wrong and he's only just come home. But his fighting spirit is still strong. I want to get on with the future and uh, on the work side, I've got some big projects that will get a homeless youth refuge built in the outer west and I want to get some more youth workers working for my fund, and that's where I'm focused.
Professor Rosenfeld had to go in one more time to clean the deadly bacteria out of Casey's brain. And this time, it looks like they got it all. I feel a lot better than before, and every day I'm getting stronger. And um, I feel a lot more in my, up here in my head, like it's healing a lot more. I'm more energetic, I'm getting up a lot more. I've been very lucky, I'm very thankful. Casey's latest scans show she's definitely getting better. If you have a look here, you can see that the abscess that she had at the front there is now gone. There's a little bit of inflammation around the edge, but it's not an abscess anymore. And also down here, she had a very big abscess developing down here, and that's now a tiny little thing. And I'm hoping that the antibiotics will be enough to just clear all of that up completely. Don't know for sure, but I think she's going to get back to pretty well what she was like before. So I think she'll make a very good recovery from all of this. You know, she really was fighting an uphill battle when she first came in. But we're winning now. The bugs are losing, we're winning. Say bye-bye, mommy. <laughs> Take care. Take care. Take care. You see you soon. <laughs> Next time in the Alfred's ICU. Mum and Dad are here. The fact that he's not woken up probably does indicate that there has been some level of brain injury that has occurred. Big breath there. Just the way. Well done. He would have eventually died without a heart transplant. Look at his heart beating away. The lungs are full of swine flu itself. I think he has a high chance of dying.